So, good afternoon, everybody. We're here with Anil Madhavapedi and Richard Mortier for Mir Mirage OS. Afterwards, there will be time for Q&A. So, please re uh, keep sitting down. After the Q&A is done, move out. Enjoy. Thank you. Firstly, uh, thank you for uh, pronouncing my name so well. That was an excellent job of, uh, of, of getting the last name. So uh, the FuzzDev organizers asked us to uh, step in to give a talk in the miscellaneous track um, at the last minute. So uh, this is going to be a truly experimental talk where uh, we're going to show you something we've been working on that is a new way of building uh, cloud services. And our goal was, um, after a lot of years of hacking on operating systems, I used to work in Zen and uh, BSD and Mort's and a lot of uh, Linux hacking, we were very, very burnt out with um, kernel programming. Uh, and we also wanted a simple way to build services online. And we wanted to experiment with new programming languages as well. And so the result is actually this entire talk that I'm about to give to you um, is hosted on a, it's about a two megabyte microkernel running on top of Zen. And the entire kernel is written in a functional programming language called OCaml, which is type safe. So it's immune to a lot of memory errors and so on. And this includes not only the web code, but also the device drivers, the TCP IP stack, and everything that goes into serving these pages on the internet, you know, DHCP and IP and so on. Uh, and the application code, which we'll demonstrate to you um, how it works, uh, was put together uh, with just a few lines of code. And the tool chain that we've uh, published as open source um, is doing all the hard work to let you worry about Zen and Unix and so on. Uh, and the, this uh, slide deck is actually hosted live. So if you wanted to follow along on your laptop, uh, we got the URL wrong. Sadly, type safety does not help uh, fix typos in URLs. Uh, you can go to dex.openmirage.org and go to FOSDEM14, of course. And uh, it, will, uh, it, will, uh, it will show you the, uh, the right URL. And as part of this as well, uh, this really simplifies the deployment and tracking of these binaries um, that we deploy on GitHub. So I'll, I'll demonstrate how uh, we, we actually use Git to keep track of everything that we push to the cloud uh, in a very extreme way. So first of all, just to give me an idea, how many people here have done any uh, hypervisor or kernel programming? Just, just put your hands up. All right, I can see, I can see a lot of Zen people who I know, and pretty much everyone else is not. How many have done uh, experimentation in, in uh, functional languages like OCaml or Haskell or Erlang? Oh, that's awesome. So it's about half of the audience has, has done functional programming. So uh, I'm going to show you how we can, we can kind of put these together. But because not many people have, uh, have used Zen before, let me give you a quick um, overview of how Zen works first. So whenever you deploy anything onto the cloud, it usually runs in a hypervisor these days. So be the hypervisor it could be Zen, it could be VMware, it could be KVM, uh, it could be VirtualBox. Uh, and generally how they work, the, the, uh, the, they're called type 1 hypervisors, is that they run a domain zero, which is responsible for all of the physical device drivers. So it's a, it's a uh, operating system that boots and it takes over the network card and the device drivers um, for storage and so on and so forth. And then the hypervisor lets you boot up virtual machines. And these virtual machines um, have fake device drivers that think they're running on real hardware, but in fact, they're actually interfacing with Zen, in this case, and they're talking to the outside world. Um, and so typically what happens um, in the system is that you run a guest kernel, which is running a fake virtual network device. And then in your virtual machine, you run your normal applications. So you can run your JVM, your PHP code, your, your Node.js code, um, and it works just as if it would work in a physical machine. So, where do all the threats come from? Why is this so difficult to get right? Typically what happens is the traffic is flowing from the internet with all the bad guys. It's flowing from other people, for example, on Amazon or Rackspace, um, who can also have access to your virtual machines. And there's a number of different mechanisms by which these attacks can come and uh, uh, attack your machine. So the most obvious way to uh, start securing your machine is to use better programming languages. So let's say, for example, um, uh, you suddenly become uh, an expert in Java programming and you decide to write your uh, web application using Java, at this point, Java is not C. It's not uh, vulner as vulnerable to memory attacks. And so you can actually defeat a lot of conventional problems by rewriting your code in Java. But there's an obvious problem here. Uh, while you've rewritten your application, your Linux kernel, uh, the 15 million lines of uh, code running your TCP IP stack and your device drivers, is still written in C. So it's a bit like protecting your generals in the back of an army, but the soldiers at the front line, the people that parse the traffic, are still very vulnerable. So if you have a bug in the TCP IP stack, 
it doesn't matter what your application is written in because your whole system is not type safe and your virtual machine is now compromised. So rewriting the whole of Linux uh, in uh, a safe language is possible and it's, uh, several attempts have been done, but we don't really know what the performance costs are. So the system I'm showing you is trying to rewrite everything in a type safe way uh, in, a, in a single framework uh, and also trying to make it as fast as the existing deployments by using several tricks that I'll outline to you. Um, and one of the mechanisms that where we get this performance from, because nothing comes for free, is by re-architecting what we put into a virtual machine. So normally when you have a virtual machine, the primary focus is backwards compatibility. It is to say that if you used to run this on your physical uh, machine about 10 years ago, it should continue to run. And it should continue to work without surprises. So we say we don't care about that anymore, right? We've, we've, we've learned how that works. Uh, we've hit the limits of that. And so what we want to do is to rearrange the way that um, the abstraction works in a virtual machine to specialize it for serving traffic. And that's all it should do. So we call these things unikernels. That is, single uh, purpose kernels that we compile. Uh, they, they don't have a general purpose uh, stack in there. They don't have a general purpose set of processes. <coughs> they only, for example, serve web traffic or serve IMAP traffic or whatever else you're doing. Uh, and so we can use this rearrangement to claw back some performance and make the whole system really quite, uh, uh, quite good. So the two messages here, I've kind of given you a quick overview, is that we're using the hypervisor, which is this new kind of hardware abstraction, uh, to let us build these experimental operating systems. If you tried to do this in a normal, uh, on normal physical hardware, we'd spend our whole lives building all the Linux device drivers. But luckily, uh, with Zen and with KVM and so on, uh, we actually have this hypervisor that gives us the ability to write these new operating systems, and the hypervisor takes care of all of the hardware. So we can actually just get on with the interesting uh, bits from our perspective and play with protocol libraries and so on uh, that will form little cloud components. So this is what our new system looks like. In, in this world, um, our stack is just a, is a dedicated virtual machine, and all of the application logic and the runtimes are all glued together. And so in some ways, you can view this as just reducing the number of layers of software that are put in the cloud and just replacing uh, the Unix process abstraction with virtual machines. And so just consider launching virtual machines on Amazon is the same as launching a lot of processes on your, on your uh, Linux or FreeBSD laptop. So we're just kind of making that analogy uh, at the same time. So how, how did this all kind of fit together? So whenever you try to compile a normal bit of code, let's take, for example, um, a, a bit of uh, C code. Part of the problem with the way that we currently build stuff is the number of APIs you have to go through. So you have to start from some source code, and the source code is, say, C code. You then compile it into an object file using GCC or LLVM. You then have some libraries that are also compiled, and you link those together uh, using LD, perhaps some dynamic linking, and then you have a user line li uh, binary that you have to execute. And at this point, you've gone through several tools, and then you have to contact the kernel from the binary and talk to all of these network stacks and so on. So this is the typical data flow, uh, the control flow in, 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 in the way uh, a normal binary talks to uh, the kernel. So the problem here is that every one of these pieces introduces a little bit of policy and a little bit of uh, mechanism into what it does. You know, for example, the kernel forces you to uh, not open low ports unless you're root. The, uh, the binary mechanism forces you to do some other things. And before you know it, it's a very confusing thing to debug because every level has a different API, different calling conventions, and different uh, requirements and privileges and so on. Uh, and this has really evolved over the last kind of 20 to 30 years. So what do we do differently? So let's assume for a moment that you know, we are academics so we can just forget the real world. And let's say that we control the entire tool chain. So what we do is we write all of our source code um, uh, in, in a language called OCaml. And we compile it as normal to object files. But at this point, uh, we don't just output a binary. What we do is we say, well, uh, what if my TCP IP stack was also in a camel library? Uh, what if my device drivers were also a camel libraries? So the compiler, instead of stopping, just kind of continues. Uh, and this is why the project has taken so long, because we had to rewrite. Uh, we couldn't just take an existing stack. We rewrote all of these uh, device drivers and stacks in a camel. And before you know it, you have a lot of uh, code that forms your operating system. And at this point, uh, you pretty much don't need a kernel because I've got all the things a kernel normally gives me. But what I do need is the ability to boot. So we have this tiny boot library that just says, um, I will boot uh, on Zen, and I will start your language runtime, and then I will start giving you traffic. So what's missing here? So we've got the ability to build a new kernel, and we're just missing our configuration files. And if I also, in this world, rewrote my configuration files, for example, uh, what service to start, what port to listen on, I also write those in a camel. Let's just write everything in a camel. 
And at this point, um, the compiler has a full view of everything going into the cloud. So what we've pushed our compiler right in the middle of our compilation stack, and the output is fully optimized. It can do all of the usual good things a compiler does, like type checking and uh, constant optimization, and just outputs a tiny little microkernel that you, you run uh, your normal applications with. And so this is the essence of how we want to work. So I just want to write some high-level code, and I want this magic tool chain to just output these specialized kernels for me. And if I want to make any changes at all, including configuration changes, I don't need to SSH in and change something. I just recompile a new kernel, and I just deploy them. So this experiment is trying to figure out, is this a viable way of building cloud services? And what are the benefits of doing so? So uh, we, since this is falls down, right, we've got to minimize the number of slides. So I wanted to show, even if the slides are written in an experimental operating system, so I wanted to show you quickly an overview of what this is. And then Mort here will, uh, will actually just demonstrate this by building a live uh, site for you. So we, had, we write a normal bit of a camel code. We'll come back to explain uh, what this is shortly. Uh, and this one is just a simple one that's saying hello world, and it's looping, and it's printing dots um, every one second. When you do the source code, um, then we have to write a configuration file. And this is just more OCaml. And we define uh, the device drivers in OCaml for what this job is. In this case, I'm just saying that there's a console, and it uh, provides a job. And I want to hook it up to my default console and register the application. So it's, it's a fairly simple, uh, it's a simple device driver, and we'll talk about more. At this point, I can just build this whole thing under Unix, uh, be it you know, Linux, BSD, or Mac OS X. Um, I just use this uh, homebrew-based, uh, in the case of Mac OS, a package manager called OPAM that we wrote. Uh, and then we configure it for Unix, and we have a Unix binary. At this point, I've debugged my very simple application, and I want to deploy it on Zen. So all I have to do is just recompile the same source code uh, by just um, adding a configuration flag, and the toolchain will give me a Zen kernel instead. And the Zen kernel uh, has no requirement on Linux or any, any kernel devices. It's just a specialized uh, microkernel. And all of the magic happens via the OCaml module system. So the reason we picked OCaml um, is because it's based on functional programming. And it has one of the most powerful module systems of any language. And the purpose of a module system is to let you write code and to reuse it in kind of interesting contexts, but in a safe way. So you can propagate abstractions. So let me show you um, how this works for a simple web server. So if I'm building this, this home page, um, then I will write some code at the bottom called my home page, for example. And it will depend on an HTTP library. And this HTTP library, the only thing it knows is how to serve and respond to HTTP requests. And this HTTP library depends on a TCP stack. And normally what you do is you just do bind your TCP stack to Unix, and you depend on a Unix module. Right? This is not unexpected. This is how a normal uh, uh, set of language bindings to an operating system work. But remember, my goal is to get rid of Linux. So I want to uh, remove this dependency on Unix and move to um, uh, a pure set of OCaml libraries. So the first thing I can do is I can use my OCaml module system to say, well, hang on, don't use sockets anymore. Replace the sockets with the TCP stack that I wrote um, in OCaml. But this TCP stack has the same signatures as the, uh, the original socket-based stack, but it implements all of the logic that the normal kernel does. And then it goes into the TunTap interface in Unix, which lets you receive Ethernet frames directly. So we've kind of cut away about half of our kernel by switching to this uh, TCP stack. But we still depend on Unix for everything else. And then we can run another mode where I can say, how do I get my device drivers and my Ethernet stack? Well, why don't you just hook in Zen device drivers, again, written in a camel, um, and they satisfy the network interface signature. And then before you know it, all of your signatures and libraries kind of fit together. So this approach of adding modules and removing them <laughs> lets you kind of chop and change your source code and control precisely what you put in the kernel. So at this point, Mort is going to uh, show you this for the, uh, the slides website. Here you go, Mort. Uh, not, OK. Uh, can everybody hear me through these mics? Yeah? Yeah. OK, so what I'll do is I'll go through, I'm not going to do the slides website. I'll go through th some fairly simple examples, going from a simple console example so you can see what that looks like, um, working up to the full network stack that Anil just showed. So if we look at the console example, first off, the actual code itself um, is uh, pretty much what hopefully you can see here. So we've got a main module, um, which has got an entry point start, and that's going to be passed a single variable C, which is the concrete console that we're going to be able to write to. Okay? The line above that, this here, has said that this main module is going to be passed a module that satisfies the signature of a console. So it's going to be passed something that looks like a console. And then all that's going to happen is we've got a for loop here where we'll loop twice, uh, printing hello, sleeping for a second, printing world. Okay, so it's a 
pretty simple sort of Hello World application. The configuration for that is also, as Neil showed, fairly simple. So we declare this main function, or this main variable rather, which is going to have the entry, defines the entry point, so that's unikernel.main, which is this thing up here um, in your camel module system, and it's got this signature, this simplistic signature that just says, I'll take a console and I'll give you back a job that you can run. And then this is the actual OCaml entry point for a piece of code, um, and that registers this application and says, here's a thing to run, it's this thing we defined here, and then we're going to pass it just the default console, you just want to be printing stuff to the screen. So if I then uh, type correctly that, that's the Mirage tool running, configuring everything. I can then Mirage build console config. And if I then run uh, Mirage console, we get the output that we'd expect. OK, so that's hopefully fairly simple, fairly understandable. If I now flip to uh, a Zen, a running instance of Zen, um, so if I so see here I'm in domain zero, I've not got any other virtual machines running. Uh, if I change to the right directory, which I thought I'd done before, um, I can now, if I do Mirage, uh, configure, console, config, dash, dash, Zen. So I'm now configuring for Zen, and again, Mirage build, console, config, uh, and then up here, Excel create. So you can see that running there. Um, that's probably going to have finished by now, so I'll recreate that. But now, <clears throat> attaching, to the, attaching to the console of this Zen virtual machine, and we'll see again the Hello World is printing out. So that's now the Zen virtual machine running all the same code as previously. If we move on to the network stack, uh, we look at it as, uh, let me just show you what the code looks like first. Um, so in this case, I'll look at the config file first. So the config file is, here is a little bit more complicated. So similar kind of thing at the top. So we're going to define a main function again. It's going to invoke uh, the start method of a module called main inside a module called unikernel. But now the signatures are slightly more complex. So instead of just being console to job, this is console to a network stack to a job. So we're going to attach a network stack in here. There's then a bunch of configuration stuff so that I can control which instance of Mirage is going to get used for this. So am I going to use the uh, Unix socket-based network stack, or am I going to use the Mirage direct network stack, for example? Do I want to acquire my, the address for this application because it's statically assigned, or do I want to acquire it through DHCP? Um, but then similar thing down at the bottom where, again, we're going to register at the entry point the let open parenthesis, close parenthesis. And we're going to register an application, and it's going to run the main function and it's going to start passing in the device drivers that are necessary. So in this case, the default console and then the, the network stack. The network stack is itself parameterized by the console because the stack may want to do some debug outputs. Um, if I look then at the application itself, uh, uh, so this is a bit more complex. There's not that many lines to show you this. But essentially, Hopefully you can see it's somewhat similar to the console example. So we've got the module main again. This time we're passing in both the console and the network stack to that. We've got this start entry point again, which gets past the concrete instances of the console and the stack. And then we configure the stack. And in this case, we're going to do something fairly simple. So it's just going to start listening TCP uh, connections on port 80. Um, it's going to extract the flow details from that. And then it's going to read data off that t incoming TCP connection and print it back out again. And it'll deal with a couple of error conditions down the bottom. So if uh, we configure this, uh, but I do it with uh, net equals socket, then build and Uh, run as sudo, because it's going to be port 80. So I have to allow that to run. So that application is now running, accepting connections on port 80. Uh, so 
So that's now read off that TCP connection on port 80. Um, if I come back up here and I now rebuild, reconfigure to be direct with, let's say I don't have a DHCP server running, so I'll run a static instance. I can run the same commands again, build, and run the network. Whoops. Interesting. Oh, I've probably got something running already. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Why is that still got a pit on? Anyway. Yeah. Kill 5597, whatever that is. There we go. Let's try that again. There we go. Right, so I've now got uh, that direct thing running. I've got to assign an IP address to that, so I just pause that for a second. And assign that, then I should be able to now send it to the direct stack. So that's now traveled through the OCaml based network stack rather than the local sockets. If I kill that and then move back to the Zen instance, I can uh, net equals direct, because it's Zen, so it has to be, really. We don't have sockets. Uh, address equals DHCP, and then same process, configure network config dash dash Zen. And then if I once more do the Excel create, but this time I'm going to create the network instance. So now we can see we've done a DHCP request, got a DHCP response, and if I send that there, that's now a Zen virtual machine that's run the same code, received data on that socket, and printed it out. So we've got this direct correspondence between the code running for Unix, the code running for Zen, um, and I will disconnect from there and destroy. Okay, one last example then. Um, if we go to, uh, we can do a, well, sorry, two, I beg your pardon, two last examples, two quick ones. So this one, for example, is uh, a sample piece of code which is going to have similar kind of thing, so that you can see the signature is the same as before. So we've got um, console going to a network stack, v4, IPv4 network stack, producing a job. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna register two, two things that match that. So we're going to have one that is the direct network stack, so the Mirage network stack, and we're going to have this running simultaneously alongside a connection through a Unix socket, right? so the full Unix network stack. And then what's going to happen here is we're exposing a little bit more of the network stack, so we're building a bit more up on top of it. So we've got the TCP connection that we're going to have. We've got so the TCP layout we're going to have. We've got a channel built on top of that, a reliable uh, transport. Then on top of that, we've got an HTTP module. So this is the kind of thing that Anil referred to that would go into your web server. Uh, the rest of it follows a fairly similar pattern. So we've got a start entry point to this main module. Um, we have to pr uh, provide a couple of callbacks for HTTP. And all that's going to happen is when something comes in to the HTTP server, it's going to respond with a, uh, an invalid body that just says help. We're also going to have something that's listening for UDP packets, and it's just going to print out that it got some UDP on a particular port, specifically listening on port 53. Okay. Um, all of this code is in the uh, GitHub Mirage, Mirage Skeleton, FOSDEM demo branch, if you want to have a look at it in more detail. Um, so if I uh, do Mirage configure stack config Unix, Oops, if I type that correctly, that would help. Then sudo dot slash stack v4. So again, so this is the socket and the direct running. So you can see the tap zero there, as well as the unit socket being used. Um, and if I telnet uh, 127.0.0.1, port 80, and just send something that gets echoed back at us. Um, and if I tell that to, I think it was port 8080, 
and I send something there, I get nothing back. That's invalid HTML, uh, HTTP. If instead, get that, I get the content back help. So we've got the single application running there. It's got the web server running as well as something else that's listening. So it's web server on port 8080 port and something else listening on port 80, um, which is just doing an echo server. So we've combined together two modules there to create a more complex network app. Um, I'll do a final example uh, is building up a full stack. So because the network stack in Mirage is decomposed, um, you, can look, you can go in and do different things at different layers. So if you look, for example, at the, this, this sample, this is uh, a slightly different signature at the top. So here you can see it's not console to stack v4 now to job, it's console to network. So we're going to get raw access to the network device itself. Um, because we're doing it like this, we have to add a few more libraries that we're going to depend on in this application. But then the rest of it uh, looks similar. So here you can see the actual network stack being constructed uh, by hand. So you've got the opportunity in your application code to mess around with how these things are working, how these things are getting plugged together if you want to. So we're going to create an Ethernet module which comes from the network device which is passed in in the signature. So we've got the network device being passed in here. We're using that to construct an Ethernet thing. We use the Ethernet thing to construct an IPv4 thing. We use the IPv4 thing to construct a UDP thing. We also use the IPv4 module to construct a TCP module. But to construct a TCP module, you also need to have some notion of time, so you can run your timeouts, uh, some notion of a clock, same reason, and some random source for doing the sequence number initialization. And then finally, we're going to take, um, we're going to construct a DHCP client so that we can DHCP addresses for this thing. And to do that, we need, as well as a console time and randomness, we need Ethernet, IP, and UDP. So we've constructed these modules now, so we can now manipulate these in our application and do different things with them if we want to. Um, it's probably enough detail to go through there. If you want to see more detail of that, this, this example is a little bit more complex because you have to plumb things together by hand. Um, but if you go and look at the, the skeleton repo, you can hopefully see that you sort of plumb together handlers at different layers, and then it all just kind of falls out at the end. And then this, this example here would build for the direct stack on Unix, the Mirage network stack on Unix, or, again, rebuild it on Zen. You get your Zen VM running, does all the same things. Okay. And I shall hand back to Anil with that. Thank you, Martin. So, so part, of, part of the thing we're trying to get through uh, by showing you the demo there was uh, the purpose of using functional programming in this case. Because um, if we just built a normal library operating system, uh, we wouldn't have quite the level of flexibility in how we decide to assemble all these components. So what we are trying to do here is to build a whole bunch of reusable modules that are conventionally not reusable components. So for example, if you wanted to grab the Linux TCP IP stack or the FreeBSD uh, uh, storage stack, it's often quite hard to extricate it from the rest of the kernel. With the library operating system, you have very, very careful dependency control. So you make sure that you explicitly say what you depend on, and then you can assemble all these things uh, together. And what the Mirage tool is doing that Mort showed you is just generating a lot of boilerplate code so you don't have to construct all these uh, modules by hand for, for common deployments. But if you're building a very custom bit of infrastructure, if we, we do a lot of this in Zen, um, then I really want to be able to drop down to a lower level, and, and it gives you the power to do that. So uh, to give you an, uh, an idea of just how many of these things there are, if you go to the, uh, uh, the GitHub uh, repository uh, for Mirage, you'll find there's implementations in, in ML of shared memory channels, of uh, device driver trees, of shared memory rings, um, all the way up to TCP IP as well. So it's an interesting way to browse uh, and learn a bit about Camel, but also to learn how all of the uh, components in a system as complex as Zen work. Uh, so the overall uh, summary of what I've showed you here and, and what Mort has shown you is how we want to do systems programming in the future. So we want to have a model where I can use my nice uh, Unix laptop to, to develop software. Um, and then uh, I, can, I can do the development using you know, my normal uh, Vim environment or Emacs uh, in, in other people's cases and uh, have a nice interactive environment. But then I want to progressively replace my dependencies in my kernel, for example, with fake versions to uh, facilitate testing and scalability and so on. And then when I get to my final deployment, um, I want everything to be fully type safe. Uh, fully optimized and deployed and only work in Zen. So as our code matures, uh, we can pick and choose modules and discard functionality as we get closer to production uh, in such a way that we, don't, we just want to specialize it more and more and more for the task at hand. So is all of this actually worthwhile? Uh, let me just uh, show you a few micro benchmarks to give you an idea of if when you put a full system together, if you actually get any real benefits from this. So the most obvious benefit is actually the appliance size. 
So uh, one of our first milestones was Mirage was, well, if we wanted to build the, all of the Mirage's internet presence using Mirage itself, uh, we had to build a DNS server, a web server, and for some experimentation, we built OpenFlow, which is a, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, a software-defined networking protocol. And when you build these, uh, DNS is a particularly good example because when you build a DNS server, um, if you're only serving using UDP, you don't need the full complexity of a TCP stack. So in this case, uh, a bytecode-based build came out to less than half a megabyte. And this is the complete kernel that's serving DNS traffic live, um, uh, written in a fully type-safe way with OCaml and so on and so forth. And then when you add a little bit of compiler magic to do some more uh, dead code elimination, uh, it got down to hundreds of kilobytes. And there have been demos of this sort of uh, technique uh, running on 8-bit uh, PIC microcontrollers uh, with about uh, 32 kilobytes of flash. So depending on how much effort you're willing to put in to manually optimize your system, uh, this thing can get smaller and smaller and smaller. Of course, for our purposes, for running on x86 or ARM, um, a megabyte is just fine. Uh, but you can actually push it down all the way into microcontrollers. And this actually um, includes all of the configuration data. So if you're trying to boot one of these uh, systems, you normally have to give it an init root, and you have to give it a configuration uh, block device. In this case, everything is just compiled in. So this, this one file um, is actually available for use uh, in general. And boot time is also uh, a really, really big win. So if you're trying to boot a normal Linux VM, it's obviously a bit heavyweight. Uh, you can make a Linux VM boot pretty fast, but uh, then user space has to start and services have to start running. With a, with a, a Mirage kernel, or in general any of these small micro-operating systems, uh, you can boot in, uh, in uh, 30 to 40 milliseconds. So in other words, you can boot something in response to uh, a network connection and, and kill it just as soon as it happens afterwards. So this is actually a very, very nice feature that you can actually just dynamically uh, start and kill unikernels as, as you need to for your purposes um, at, at the time. To give you a sense of just how much source code is involved in all of this, um, now obviously this is a dangerous comparison to make. We're comparing with Linux in a typical distribution, but we, we have most but not all of the features of these things. So I just wanted to give you a feel for the orders of magnitude involved. So for a typical stack uh, on Linux, you have the Linux kernel. We unif def the kernel to remove um, any, uh, any dead code, you know, stuff that wasn't compiled in. And you, you find that it, it, it easily tops a million lines of code. With Mirage, uh, because we only include the libraries we need, and they tend to be more succinct anyway, because OCaml is just a, a fairly succinct language, uh, we, we end up with uh, around 100,000 lines of code. And the amount of C code involved is just the OCaml runtime. So all the device drivers and so on are built uh, using the high-level abstractions. So this is just generally more easy and tractable to, to experiment with and benchmark and so on, because you don't have to deal with uh, an ever-increasing general purpose operating system. The library operating system lets you just you know, take modules off the shelf uh, and, and, and work with those. One of the coolest things about all of this um, has been, uh, because we have these small kernels, the next obvious thing to do is to manage everything in Git. And so now we have this situation where uh, I can commit an update to the Mirage website, and because we're running this through this package manager, um, I have a complete list of all of the libraries required to build this kernel. Now, stop for a second and imagine, if you are deploying, a, uh, for example, an Ubuntu image online or a Debian image online, in theory, you can get all of the source code that that image depends on, but it's actually quite a lot of hassle, right? You have to go through and uh, manually uh, go through all the apt and all of the various packaging systems to get uh, probably close to uh, uh, 1,000 to 3,000 packages. With our website, we have about uh, 20 to 30 libraries, and uh, the compiler just keeps track of everything. So what happens is that with the Mirage website, um, I'm a programmer, I write some source code, and ultimately, I have the cloud. I have you know, EC2 or Rackspace, and I simply want to uh, serve these websites. So what happens is that um, I, I, I run my OPAM install, as uh, Mort just did, and it goes to uh, Git source. For example, you can go to GitHub, but it can use any, any Git repositories, and it figures out the complete set of source code manifest that it needs. So it just figures out um, which version of the TCP stack and which version of the Unix stack is required. And at this point, the compiler, uh, which sits right in the middle of the workflow, uh, takes the configuration and so on, runs type checking, does a full optimization, and just spits out the final uh, one to two megabyte kernel. And so we just take this kernel and we commit it to Git again, and then this binary repository is sufficient to fully understand what you just deployed in the cloud. And so this is actually one of the nicest features for managing deployments, because uh, at this point, I can actually close the loop. So this is something we work on at the moment. Um, if at any point I push a security fix to one of these repositories, well, my binary kernel there can just watch that repository and recompile itself on demand. 
So you can actually just form a little closed loop where we have a small number of repositories and therefore you can just recompile uh, and make it, all, make it all kind of fit together. So this is uh, where we want to head to. We want to head to um, using Git for everything where you can actually have your binaries and your source code all tracking your services. Uh, and because these services are so small, you have the agility to just deploy them uh, and push them around uh, using normal tools without requiring anything special. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a it's a very convenient way to do deployments in the future, we think. So I just want to summarize generally where we are, because um, I wanted to just leave a little bit of, uh, of time for uh, questions and so on. So one thing we found is that using OCaml was a surprisingly good systems language for this. Uh, we've written a lot of uh, functional language code now, and we've not, never really had a need to write anything in C beyond the runtime itself. As we get into writing more crypto code and so on, we'll almost certainly need to write uh, some in C, but at least we can contain our requirements quite carefully. Uh, the system also does not have any threads. So it doesn't have preemptive threads in the normal way when you build systems. Um, our entire system is cooperatively threaded. And what this cooperative threading means is that uh, you, you have the ability to, uh, within a uh, application, block all of the threads. You have to cooperate in order to work. But our threat model is that we trust our own code because when you're within an, an appliance, you're not running any untrusted code because we're compiling everything in, in one go. And so in this world, that actually gives us a lot of performance to, uh, to work with. Uh, one obvious downside to this uh, is that we have to rewrite everything in OCaml all the way from the TCP stack and device drivers uh, and, and appliances. So as a research project goes, it was, it was an interesting experiment, but it's also interesting to see how practical it has become now. Uh, there are several other approaches to this. For example, RUMP kernels and OSV um, offer a compatibility layer, but in return, of course, they remove from some of the safety and security and programmability that Mirage offers. But depending on how, how pressing your needs are, those are often more practical ways to experiment with the same techniques. But if you just wanted to experiment with, for example, your minimal uh, homepage, your website presence, then Mirage is actually a great way to do that. And this has been one of the, uh, one of the areas where it's been an extremely useful learning experience. So it's only when you actually build one of these homepage deployments that you really understand what goes into hosting something on the web. So when you actually start running DNS servers and you actually start running a little SMTP servers and you start running little web servers and you want to keep track and update those, you start to appreciate just how hard it is to, uh, for example, uh, to move away from social networking services to running your own distributed uh, decentralized things. So we're finding that rewriting these protocols also teaches us uh, and gives us the ability to uh, express precisely what goes into our online services. Uh, and finally, the cloud came at just the right time because these unikernels um, are the perfect building blocks. Normally, when you're building operating systems, you have to worry about uh, binary interfaces, you know, DLLs and Windows and so on. But the only thing we care about are open protocols. Because we only communicate through HTTP or XMPP or IMAP, well, it means that I don't care what is behind that service. So in other words, it doesn't matter if it's a unikernel or a, a Node.js server or whatever else. So we can actually just swap out our experimental stacks and actually just put them, uh, put them in place uh, behind, uh, behind a protocol layer. And if you really have some legacy code that you need to run, something that only runs in an operating system, the whole thing is running in the cloud. So in other words, I can spin up a Linux VM and communicate with that and use, that, uh, and use uh, unikernels as proxies into, into the old code. So there's very few cases we found where we have to have uh, this code r running at uh, any given time. So just to give you an idea, if, uh, it's all open source and there's loads of protocols and we're putting more and more uh, up there. A lot of this code is actually being used within the Zen distribution these days. Uh, for example, to run the low-level uh, device drivers and uh, coordination systems, and we're increasingly moving to high, higher level things. The storage stack is particularly interesting because uh, we actually have a pure implementation of Git, so this actually gives us the ability to uh, synchronize and coordinate uh, using just normal Git tools, and we also have things like disk images like VHD and FAT file systems and so on. Uh, and other people have built uh, interesting uh, OCaml-based uh, distributed key value stores, for example, like Aracoon, and these actually work pretty well within, within our model. So while there's, uh, 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 quite, there's quite a small amount of code compared to something uh, mammoth like the Node community or the Ruby community, there's actually a, a growing bunch of protocols that actually make this practical to use. So um, the main effort here uh, around open source is going from a research project to actually having usable tools. So when you saw this demo, you, you saw a lot of kind of moving parts. And so our efforts have been focused around how do we make this thing usable and deployable for our own use. So uh, for example, we're both switching our home pages over to use Mirage. And as soon as you start depending on it to do blog updates, uh, it suddenly becomes really pressing to make sure that these tools work. They're not just little prototypes. So we have this cool package manager called OPAM, which uh, is now being used uh, by most of the OCaml community to manage libraries in general. 
Uh, and so you can go to opad.camel.org and install it through, uh, on Debian or, or Homebrew. And there's also a, a, an O'Reilly book called Rule of the Camel, which, uh, which, which uh, will help you learn about uh, uh, using a camel in, in production. And so that's actually freely available online and also uh, being sold by the O'Reilly booth up there, just in case you care. Um, so some of the cool, cool uses, I just wanted to leave you with a bit of flavor of where we're taking this. Uh, one thing that we are very passionate about is free software and free services and trying to move away from monolithic de uh, centralized services uh, into running our own infrastructure. So you control your personal data. And so one of the primary uses of Mirage is to let normal people build services that are more secure than running the rather complicated application stack that we run today. And so the idea here is that if you can run these kind of type safe services, we should reduce the amount of security updates um, or at least automate them by tracking everything that, uh, that you're exposed to. So we have an ARM port in progress. So I don't know if any of the Zen ARM hackers are here. Yep, I can see a few there. So there's actually a port of Zen to ARM now. And this means that I can buy a QB board, for example, and actually uh, boot these things on tiny embedded devices as well as on x86. So this is a really exciting path to go down. And as you're building more custom kind of proxies and middle boxes, uh, this is a, a really nice way to experiment with, with uh, building custom services that only do one thing. For example, a web proxy or a memcached. And I've already mentioned the self-updating VMs. So uh, there's loads of polishing to do. Uh, just to make it clear, we've just pushed the 1.0 release out. Uh, we're getting lots, lots of users. In other words, we're getting lots of bugs. So uh, it, it's interesting, but it's definitely some assembly required at the moment. So you, it, but it's a great way to learn. It's probably the most exciting time in the project is when it just gets started. This is when all of the, the interesting changes happen. Uh, but we're also working on many backends. So if you really want to, you can compile the whole thing to JavaScript or FreeBSD kernel modules. The, the modular mechanism we mentioned is actually general enough that you can port it to almost any hardware backend uh, that can run a, a C interpreter. Uh, and we also want to add support for KVM and VirtualBox and so on. So this has been a whirlwind tour. We, just, we hope you got something of the demo, and we want to give you a feel for uh, some, of the, uh, some of the areas of development. And there's loads of links online. So feel free to grab me for the rest of the day. I will be uh, no doubt having beer since we were staying up very late uh, doing this demo. Uh, but also, uh, there's, uh, the O'Reilly folks asked me to mention that there is indeed a copy of the O'Reilly book upstairs as well. So we have about five copies left. So if you uh, run up there, you can actually just grab those before they go, uh, or just grab it online and uh, get a feel for a camel. So thanks. I'll take any questions uh, we have about the slide. Hi. You mentioned that rewriting the TCP stack wasn't so hard, but I find it's a quite tough job. How well is your stack tested? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, um, so when I said not hard, it actually took about two years. <laughs> so uh, the, the stack is actually pretty, pretty complete in the sense that it supports retransmission and multiple congestion controllers and so on. Uh, but the thing we're doing next is we're plugging it alongside a real stack and we're running simulations to make sure that our behavior of our stack corresponds to the FreeBSD network stack. So because this is a functional uh, version, uh, we can actually just uh, take real packet traces and then run it through our logic, but not generate real packets, and then compare it to conventional stacks. So this is good enough. It, you know, it's, it's compliant with the RFCs and so on, well, as compliant as you can be. Um, but uh, we, it still requires a lot of mature testing against something as uh, uh, good as the FreeBSD or the Linux network stack. So for, uh, but a lot of the complexity of um, performance and so on disappears in the stack because we're, our application is directly linked against the stack. So there's no socket API or any of the, the Cisco layers that make the normal TCP stack quite complicated. So yeah, it works, you know, self-hosted, but... So if you look at openmirage.org, for example, or the dex.openmirage.org, that's all running using, using that TCP stack. So it's good enough for those purposes. But it does need more work. Yeah. That's it for us. Uh, you showed some memory um, benchmarks and you showed uh, some benchmarks uh, around boot time, but uh, what about general performance? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really have time to show general performance because the, uh, uh, the, the demo took a lot of time, but uh, I can show you very quickly, uh, and, the, and these are available on dex.openmirage.org. Uh, we have, for example, DNS performance metrics where uh, we measured Mirage, the DNS server, in multiple modes against bind, NSD, and uh, a C equivalent running in, uh, in, in Minos. Now, the, some of these benchmarks have been superseded recently, so the, uh, the ClickOS folks from NEC have been doing loads of work to optimize Zen networking, so they've got some really impressive numbers um, uh, around uh, doing uh, 
normal C servers compiled onto, uh, onto, onto Linux, but when, uh, onto Zen. But when you uh, look at bind and NSD, um, the Mirage version, the, which is the blue one up there, actually performs pretty well. Because it uses a technique called memoization for DNS, where um, it doesn't do repeated work. Because it's a functional stack, um, if it gets a similar set of work, it just caches the result and, uh, and simply adjusts the output packets. So in this case, we can actually, for some workloads like DNS, we can just outperform things and maintain our type safety pretty well. For other things like web servers and so on, uh, we do pretty well, but it's, you know, it's about the same performance as Linux. So in this case, uh, we can show a web server stack running with different configurations, you know, six VMs, one VM, uh, and maintain uh, a bunch of web throughput just to, to measure uh, various things. Uh, there's, rather than go through it all in detail now, there's a paper on uh, the website. Uh, it's at an uh, academic conference that has a full kind of layout of all the benchmarks and so on. So benchmarking is obviously quite complicated, but the overall message is we're good. We're, we're good enough to match Linux. Uh, in, in, uh, 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 but there's obviously there's a, a lot of cases in which case will be worse and other people will be, will be better. Any other questions? Or a box, maybe. Uh, have you heard about the Erlang on Xen project? Oh, yeah. So, uh, by the way, just to make sure, there's loads of these, uh, these projects out there. So, um, there's, uh, let me see if I can get this right. So, w there's a Windows version called Drawbridge. Uh, the Erlang and Zen guys are doing a great job of. Uh, now, the only problem with Erlang and Zen is that it's not open source. So, it's hard to evaluate it. Uh, but it's, you know, it's the, the right example is using Erlang with this kind of specialized mechanism. Uh, there's ClickOS, there's OSV, which were both here at, at Fosdem. Uh, did you give talks yesterday? Hal -VM. And there's HalVM, which is a Haskell version. So the closest one to Mirage is actually HalVM. So um, all the other ones are looking for uh, a different domain. So ClickOS is looking for network middle box performance. Uh, but we're specifically looking for how do you build these tiny kernels with type safety. And so if you like Haskell, then HalVM is a great option. Uh, and if you want to do more kind of you know, imperative style programming, then OCaml is a great option for this as well. So there's, there's quite a lot of cases where you can experiment with your favorite language, uh, and the general technique of unikernels is getting more popular. Uh, and so we just generally need help in uh, cloud tool stacks, making it easier to boot these kernels, because a lot of the cloud tool stacks are specialized for booting Linux uh, or Windows VMs. So there's just a lot of plumbing required in OpenStack and so on to, to make this easier to use. Oh, uh, a combination of ISC license, so it's like the OpenBSD license, um, or LGPL for some components, like the Camel runtime. So it's uh, nothing worse than LGPL v2. Any questions? Left? Nope. Thanks. That's it. Thanks for your time. That was great.